I can't believe the last time I was in Nepal was in 2006 and back then I was here to make a film about a blind climber attempting to summit the north face of Mount Everest but that's another story. So on this one month long epic adventure I'm going to go to a place that I've never been before Everest Base Camp on the south side. When I recorded this piece to camera I had a story in my mind, a script but by the time I'd reached Everest Base Camp, that script had been ripped up because what I found there made a profound impact. An impact that I'm still trying to deal with and process even today. This is my story, the shocking truth about Everest Base Camp. You know the expression deja vu? Well, for me, this place, the Radisson Hotel in Kathmandu, is deja vu on steroids because in 2006, I spent nearly two weeks at this hotel preparing for my big Everest expedition. And now, some sort of 16, 17 years later on, I'm getting ready for my micro expedition to Everest Base Camp on the south side because back in 2006, we were at the north side. So it's the south side here I come, and the plan. The plan is for today is to drive five or six hours to Rami Shap, where we're going to spend the night. And then tomorrow, our plan is to get a little, little aircraft to Lukla airstrip deep in the Himalayas. And that's going to be an interesting flight. I've done that a few times before, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, it's got a bit of a reputation, but it is what it is, and I'm looking forward to it. And that's the plan. So I'm so excited that you're going to be watching this film and joining my adventure to every space camp and beyond. So please do subscribe to my channel and give my film a like. It means so lot. It means so much to us YouTubers. So give us a subscribe and a like and join me on this awesome friggin' adventure starting off at the Radisson Hotel in Kathmandu. Kathmandu. <laughs> So normally, most flights leave from Kathmandu, but because of the recent demand, the airport simply can't cope. So on this occasion, we took the five-hour drive to the small airstrip of Ramashap. So we've arrived. This is it. This is Ramashap. This is our, this is our first camp for the night. And it's quite a good drive, really. It was about five hours. A bit bumpy, but what do you expect? Nice to, nice to get out of Kathmandu. Nice to experience bit more fresher air and blue skies instead of the haze of Kathmandu. So um, I'm guessing the plans are sort out our individual tents, sort out our bags, have tea, biscuit maybe, and relax. And it really starts to feel that our adventure is beginning. These are the tents we've got, permanent sort of tent village and um, what you may have worked out already is that I'm not doing this trip alone. Um, I've actually bolted myself on to, uh, to an existing, an existing trip uh, led by World Expeditions, who's been doing this kind of stuff all over the planet for decades. Um, you know, what, why do that? I mean, I, c I could have organized it myself and, and found local guides and, and porters and everything. You know, you can do that, but it's a lot of work. Um, and probably in the end of the day, it might work out more expensive. So, so on this particular trip, I have decided to just, like I say, bolt myself on to an existing trip. So joining me on this trip are four friends, Julia and Alex, and they're actually film students of mine. Marty, who's a filmmaking friend of mine, and a good old friend called Ollie. And Ollie is a super warm, friendly guy, and it is great to have four friends with me on this journey. This is it. This is all going to happen now. So probably another half an hour. I love these little kind of airports, these little kind of more runways, really. Bags check, security check, ready to go. Ready to go to Lukla. Our guide on this trip was a man called Rinzing Sherpa. He was arguably the best guide I've ever had. His knowledge of the local environment and the culture was incredible, but most importantly, he was a warm and friendly guy. Just when you jump out, watch This out. is uh, really, really good fun. I, I love little aircraft. I just find them so funky. 
and uh, obviously sitting right up at the front is even better. We can watch, uh, watch our pilots. So one of the things I've been telling my friends about our expedition would be the flight to Lukla because it's got a bit of a reputation. A reputation of being one of the most dangerous flights in the world. And that's primarily because of weather and flying through cloud, especially with massive mountains either side of you. Also, the landing at Lukla Airport is very, very challenging. The runway is about 30% too short. So to compensate, there's a 12% gradient to slow your flight down. And Lukla is part of Edmund Hillary's legacy to the Sherpa people. Obviously, we landed safely, but with a very short turnaround of about 10 or 15 minutes, our flight had refueled, took off again, flew back to Ramashap to pick up the next bunch of hikers. So we've just left Lukla and uh, we've just now officially beginning to enter the National Park and there's an entrance fee to the park um, which we're sorting out at the moment. It's a way of collecting local revenue because oh. Nepal is, you know, it's a poor country by default and so, you know, it helps when tourists come over to this region that they contribute towards it. So I've no problems paying money to go into a national park and what a national park it is. There's also a police station um, where they can check your bags because one thing that you're not allowed to take into the National Park, which frustrates the hell out of me as a filmmaker, but I do understand it, and that's a drone. Um, they really do not allow them. So if you are thinking of coming and doing your own adventure, leave it up behind. And I guess primarily the main reason for this is because while we've been waiting, sort of five, 10 minutes for the paperwork to be done, already three helicopters have gone overhead and there's a lot of air traffic going along. So, you know, flying drones with helicopters in the air and light aircraft isn't a smart idea. It is frustrating because, you know, then you get the stunning photography, but at the end of the day, it's not allowed and obviously safety comes first. So the distance from Lukla to Everest Base Camp isn't that far. You could probably hike it under a week or so. But because of the altitude, you have to allow for climatization. Your body has to have time to reproduce extra red blood cells. And that's why our trip took so long as it did. We had to acclimatize to be successful. This first day is going to be really easy. We keep on stopping at these beautiful little tea houses and just sitting and chilling and enjoying the beautiful sunshine because today we're only trekking for two hours but bear in mind we got up at four in the morning so I think the first day we are entitled to a nice relaxing day but I just I just absolutely love Nepal I just I don't know it feels like it's a spiritual home for me and that sounds a bit sort of a bit sort of airy fairy but it really does I absolutely adore adore Nepal Welcome to day two. Woke up, stunning views of the mountains around us and we've only just started. We're only still really almost in the high foothills at the moment. Um, I don't know if you can see the beautiful peak behind me. I'll get a better shot on my Nikon in a minute, but the plan for today, well, we're gonna walk to uh, Monjo. Oh, hang on a second. Just as I'm talking, it's another helicopter and this is another example of why drones are not allowed in the national park so if you are thinking of coming please don't bring your drone because they are back and forth the whole time so anyway what was i saying um yeah we're going to monjo it's about four and a half hour walk um we take it very very easy very easy which i really enjoy because that means i can also film and then we get to monjo we're same kind of setup as you see behind me with the little green tents and um, we'll spend the rest of the day doing whatever we want to do. But I'm really looking forward to exploring more of the Khumbu Valley. For me, Nepal is a special place. And one thing that makes it special is the Buddhist culture that the country dwells on. When you trek in Nepal, you're surrounded by beautiful prayer flags and prayer flags represent earth, fire, air and water and the physical and spiritual soul 
and those prayer flags are everywhere. Also when you trek, you come across stupas, small Buddhist shrines, and that also embodies the Buddhist culture. And finally, you'll be constantly surrounded by stone tablets and prayer wheels. And written on those stone tablets and prayer wheels are the Buddhist chant Om Mani Padmi Hum, meaning jewel of the lotus flower. And it's those things that make trekking in Nepal or experiencing Nepal in general so special. Well, this, this is the end of day two. This is Monjo, and uh, we've walked about four to five hours. That's about eight kilometers, give or take. Um, it's, been, it's been good, it's been very easy. We've taken a very, very slow pace as we climb altitude, which is very, very important to acclimatize. Um, but I'm really looking forward to tomorrow and then beyond of that, because then we reach Namshi Bazaar, the home of the Sherpa people in the Kumbu Valley. Because everything before Namshi, and in fact including Namshi, has become quite westernized and has, has catered for the tourists. But once we leave Namshi, we're going to be heading out more into wilderness. And for me, that is what I've really come for, to experience the high Himalayas. When you say the word Sherpa, it's massively misrepresented. Most people consider the word Sherpa as a porter, somebody who carries your bag, and that is simply wrong. The Sherpas are an indigenous group of people, originally from Tibet, but now live in the high Himalayas. A Sherpa is like saying a Welshman, um, a Sicilian, or a Kazakh. They are a group of people, not a porter. So we've just entered Sagramata National Park. Now Sagramata is the Sherpa word for Everest. Of course Everest is the western word named after its surveyor George Everest but for the Nepali, sorry for the Sherpa it's Sagramata and we've now officially entered the main national park and from here on in it's just going to get more beautiful, more scenic and more open as we head right up into the high Himalaya via Namshi Bazaar. Namshi Bazaar is the home of the Sherpa people. It originally was a trading post, but now its primary income is supported by people like me, trekkers and hikers who pass through it, heading off to the high passes of the Himalayas. We're just coming up to one of the stunning bridges that crosses through the Kumbu Valley at an altitude of 2935. I mean, there are many bridges, of course, and without them, our trek would be damn, damn almost impossible. But this one is going to be stunning, absolutely stunning. And we're only two hours away from Namchi Bazaar. Ah, oh, these are so, these are so wobbly, but they're perfectly strong. But you do bounce a little bit, especially in the middle. And especially when you get like a, a pony or a donkey using it as well. So, um, and of course, you end up with the inevitable traffic jam. Hi. It's funny, a lot of the trekkers that come down all seem quite grumpy. I don't know why. <laughs> They're like, oh, we don't want to talk to you because we've already done it. And all the people going up are all happy and smiley. Everyone is filming everything, as you can expect in the 21st century. And what's quite funny, when I did this trek, first of all, the first time I came to Nepal actually was 2002 and no one was filming anything. Now everyone is filming everything, including myself. <sighs> anyway, bouncy, bouncy. We're reaching the end, the end of the bridge. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Now I'd been to Nepal many, many times before but probably for me, the most significant trip was back in 2006, when I was asked to make a documentary about a blind climber who was attempting to summit on the north face of Mount Everest. But unfortunately, he succumbed to altitude sickness and passed away just below the summit, where his body still remains today. But moments after he died, I was then involved in the rescue of another climber called Lincoln Hall 
from Australia and he thankfully survived. And that whole expedition has been an important part for me on my own legacy as a filmer. And in fact, that film was actually released on National Geographic Channel called Miracle on Everest. We're, uh, we're just approaching Namshi Bazaar. So the home of the Sherpa people, exactly. as mentioned, it's been a beautiful, beautiful hike. It's been hard, but what do you expect? We're walking at altitude, but we're going very, very slowly and uh, climatizing well, so no problems there. You should always walk at your own speed, you know, never, never try and catch up with anyone because it's a battle you'll never, ever win. You'll suffer like hell, literally. So always enjoy your own speed. Enjoy the view, take plenty of rest, take plenty of water, one step at a time. And these sites are there to be discovered. Whilst I was at Namshi Bazaar, I took that opportunity to have a chat with Rinzing. I wanted to find out more about the capital of the Sherpa people. This is the Kumbu region and this has almost become a capital of the Kumbu region. This is a very important place, it's called Namchi Bazaar. In early days, this used to be a trading junction between Tibet and Tibet and Nepal. And nowadays, all the trekkers come here and at least have to spend a two nights for the climatization. And it's very important. How much has it changed since you've been guiding? Well, it has been changed a lot since then. Uh, well, now, you know, as you have seen the Namchi has become quite a big, but culture hasn't changed much. And one of my big concerns was how, because the country and because this region and because Namchi Bazaar is so, so relying on tourism. Yes. When there was COVID, what was it like? Well, the COVID, I think the COVID has affected a lot. You know, it has been locked down. We cannot travel from one, one village to another village. It did affect it a lot. We struggle a lot. And, and did, did the people get any help from the government? Uh, no, our government, no. Our government is not, we can't rely on the government. Where we help each other, that is, a, that is in our culture too. But now it's becoming busier and busier and busier. Yes, now it's picking up, coming back to the normal. The last time I'd been to Nepal was about 10 years ago. And one thing I noticed on this expedition was how popular it had become. In many ways, Nepal and the Himalayas have become a victim of their own success. This is a Sheng Bushe. And uh, you might notice the kind of flat piece of land behind me. It's actually a runway. And uh, we were just told that um, planes used to land here for the Everest Hotel, but not anymore. Now it's just helicopters make use of it. It was just another example of just how popular the region has become. Having a guide like Rinzing gave us a real life walk-in encyclopedia. The, uh, the one you see right in front of us, the Black Peak is called Kumbuyula. It's a sacred mountain. The reason why they call the name is because of the sacred, not because of the height. And then we go down where we, you can see the first on the left, it's not a peak, that's called Tabuche. And then comes a tiny black rock, and behind that, you can see just the top, that is Everest, Sagarmata. And then comes on the, the pointed one on the right, the highest one is called Lotse. And then just below one is called Loche Shar. Loche Shar means Loche East. And just below, where you can facing towards the sun, which is very bright, that is a Serse and Peak 38. And comes a beautiful mountain which is called Mount Amadablam. I've been to Nepal uh, six times, I think, six times. And I must confess, the first couple of days leaving Lukla, I actually found a little bit boring. Um, it's just a repetitiousness of, of tea houses and hotels and guest houses and shops and restaurants. But when you start to go north of Namshi Bazaar, this, this is what you get. And these are the rewards and the reasons to come to the Himalayas. 
1953, Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary were the first human beings to summit Mount Everest. And even today, their legacy is still leading a lasting impression. This whole, this whole compound was built by Sir Edmund Hillary from New Zealand. Of course, Sir Edmund Hillary is famous the world over with co-siting Everest with Tenzing Norgay from Nepal. And uh, Edmund Hillary uh, was so motivated and captivated by, by the Sherpa culture, the Sherpa people, that he dedicated his life to, to trying to uh, better their lives, primarily through education and healthcare. And this school just over here is part of his ongoing legacy to help better the lives of Nepali people. And I think if you are going to undertake any adventure, an adventure itself is quite selfish, but if you can leave a positive legacy for other people or for the environment, then that only has to be a good thing. For me, Tenzing and Hillary have left their mark in history as true pioneers of mountaineering. I've just arrived at our eco camp and I'm surrounded by these stunning, stunning mountains. And I'm a bit of a mountain geek. I love mountains. And that one over there, that is Lotsi. And I think, don't quote me on this, I think it's the fourth highest in the world. And if it's not, I'll correct that in voiceover, but I'm pretty damn sure it's the fourth highest. And what a lot of mountaineers do is, elite mountaineers, is they climb Everest, Lhotse and Makalu. They kind of bunny hop between the three, but, but they are the creme de la creme of mountaineers. Only the elitist can do that. But for us mere mortals, it's just an incredible, stunning place to be here and just to see some of the world's highest mountains. I'm literally surrounded by 6,000, 7,000 and 8,000 peak mountains. What a stunning, stunning place to be. This is where it becomes worth it. Stunning. If I can do any justice on the little bitty action cam on auto settings at the moment, oh dear, that's no good. You get the idea. Absolutely stunning. And the sun is just coming over. And as soon as the sun comes over, it gets really warm. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Now I know I booked myself onto an existing trip, but I must say there is something special about hiking alone. So peaceful. I've just managed to get five minutes away from everybody else. And now I'm really enjoying the peace. There is a lot to be said to be trekking with others, but um, Already there's someone caught up. I do love trekking by myself. But it is nice to have people around you, I guess. It's okay, I'm good. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, I'll be good. You, you walk 10 meters in front, go on. Do you see what I mean? Because our Sherpa guides, they look after us so well. They feel very responsible to look after you. But many people that come here, and myself included, have trekked all over the world and, you know, we're capable of walking, you know, just a few metres behind. But it is their duty of care and I must respect that, so. But just being at the back sometimes is so good. <laughs> anyway, I better catch up before they start panicking. I also wanted to take this, this opportunity just to say how how bloody good our guide is, Rinzing, and, and all of us staff, but Rinzing is just an incredible team leader and guide. There's a lot to be said with kind of self-guiding or finding, finding someone local, but it is, it is a little bit of hit and miss. You know, if you do go with an with a organized trip like I'm doing with World Expeditions, um, you've, you've almost got a bit of, a bit of protection, you know, that, you know that your guide is going to be good. And we've met quite a few 
people on trek and their guides don't speak any English or very poor English and and you know you, you can get by but when you're in this landscape you want to more than get by because we're getting little history lessons and ecology lessons and geology lessons and cultural lessons from Rinzing as we're traveling through and it's those nuggets of information that make it all worthwhile. When you reach the 4,000 meter mark, you certainly notice the difference. This is, this is the first time we've gone higher than 4,000 meters on the trek. Um, it's fine, 4,000 meters is fine. You just get a little bit out of breath, no headaches, no problems, no loss of appetite, none of that stuff. Just a little bit harder to breathe, which is normal because there's less oxygen in the atmosphere. So fortunately, we're going at such a slow pace that you know you can recover very quickly just suck in that fresh air and last night was our last night in a tent uh, from now on in uh, it'll be lodges um, i must confess i do much prefer sleeping in tents um, i'm not a great fan of buildings and lodges and accommodation I feel more connected when I'm in a tent. I feel more connected with the environment when I'm in a tent. I sleep much better. It feels cleaner, it feels fresher. I think I may have even been born in a tent if I didn't know otherwise. <sighs> but still, stunning, stunning, bright day. I'm just a, a bit concerned that this video isn't a uh, a montage of me going this is absolutely stunning um, but I'm sure you appreciate this is the Himalayas and guess what they are absolutely stunning this is my sixth time to Nepal and uh, and it's stunning <laughs> I think it's the, the combination with the Buddhist culture, the, the, the prayer flags, the stupas, the prayer chants, Omani Padmi Hum, juxtaposed against the most incredible scenery on the planet, the make Nepal, just, oh, I can't think of a word, but that's the word to use, whatever word that is, that is Nepal. On this particular trip, as you know, I'm staying in a mixture of kind of uh, tented villages or these kind of guest houses. Now, as I think I mentioned, I prefer the tented setups, either the standing tents or the mountain tents, because like I said, I, I think I was born in a tent, so I love tents. I'm not the greatest fan of lodges, um, but they are there and we are using them. I'll give you, I'm not going to give you a guided guided tour. I mean, you, you know, you don't need me to do that. Um, but, you know, they are, they are nice. They're simple. They're effective. Um, but they are expensive. Um, Something that I've noticed, because the first time I came here was like 20 years ago, you can blow a lot of money in these places. So for example, if you had, if you used the Wi-Fi, had a hot shower, had a Mars or Snickers bar, and say bought a toilet roll, you could quite easily blow 30 US dollars in one lodge. Now, that's not a great deal of money, but if you were on a, I don't know, a 20 day hike, the idea of a cheap holiday once you get in country actually soon goes out the window actually. So, so just bear that in mind that if you do decide to stay in lodges or if your tour company puts you in lodges, you could end up spending quite a lot of money you could then argue, well, that's good because it puts it in the local economy, and that's true. But nonetheless, you know, like I say, 20, 20, 20 or so days 
$30 a day some people are spending. That's quite a lot. But anyway, let me give you a brief tour of what you can expect in one of these lodges. So we've all got our rooms. I'm in room number four and I'm sharing with my friend Marty. Um, we've only got one key, which is a little bit annoying because that means that, you know, if he goes out, I can't get in or vice versa. So, so this is room four. Let me, let me show you what our room looks like. I'll do that in a separate shot in the edit. <laughs> so with the powers of editing, this is, this is uh, our room. I mean, what can I say? It's a room. Um, actually, does the light work? This is like some kind of like house moving in show. Anyway, I can't find a light switch. Uh, I'm sure, oh, hang on a minute. Ah, there is a light switch. Not that it does much, but anyway, uh, it's probably solar powered. It's simple, you know, do not expect a lot, okay? But look, this is one that you can begin to see why I prefer tents, um, you know, I don't know how many people have slept on this mattress and I'm not using that pillow, that's for sure. There's more um, <clears throat> marks on that pillow than, yeah, anyway, let's not go there. But this, nonetheless, this is what you, type of thing you can expect. Do you really want to see? Is there someone in there? Oh. No, there's no, it's open. It's a... Uh, it's the traditional squat toilet, you know, it's okay. Um, you know, I'm not going to downgrade the quality of my film by talking about going to the toilet, but you know, when you're in the wild, I mean, I, I, you know, no problem going to the toilet, but I'm not a great fan of squat toilets in general. Um, yeah, unless you're in the wild for some reason. So anyway, squat toilets. Some of the lodges do have westernized toilets and then, uh, you know, just depends what you get and you have to put the toilet paper in a bucket because obviously the sewer system can't deal with, with uh, you know, sanitary products and toilet roll and all that stuff, but it doesn't matter. That's what toilets, yeah. But nonetheless, you know, these are the kind of things that you would expect to find. Like I say, they serve their purpose and they obviously do support the local economy, which is extremely important. And, you know, and the staff are lovely and friendly and everything. And I guess the last thing, hang on, sorry. I guess the last thing I should really show you is uh, where we eat, the kind of community area. Uh, might do that later on when we actually are having something, uh, sort of some tea and biscuits that are being provided later on. So that's a rough idea of what you can expect when trekking in Nepal, whether you're, I mean, whether you're independently doing it or doing it through a tour company, they use pretty much the same facilities, give or take. There we are. Now, one reason why I chose this particular trip was because it gave me the opportunity to visit the Gokyo Lake region. And there, there are up to 19 lakes, and some of them are as high as 5,100 meters. <sighs> what a brilliant, fresh, crisp, cold start. We've just left our guest house, and we're now heading deeper into the stunning Himalayas. Our goal, our goal to today, our goal for today is Gokyo, where we're gonna spend two nights in a lodge because tomorrow we're gonna to head to Gokyo Rai. And from there, we can get some absolutely stunning views of some of the highest mountains in the world, including Mount Everest. So tomorrow is for me, is gonna be the highlight of the trip and I'm so looking forward to that part. At this kind of altitude, things can and do go wrong. The effects of altitude are always very present. How are you finding these last couple of days as we get some altitude, Ollie? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, you can hear it now, breath. It's, I think we're almost coming up to 5,000 meters and even sleeping, waking up, trekking, even though we're setting us a very light pace, it's just getting your breath. It's just trying to catch it. And it's just something that you've never, you could never experience. And I'm slowly getting used to it, but not at the same time. It was time to find more about the Gokyo Lakes. So 
who better a person to ask than rinsing? Where are we rinsing? Because this is just, well, incredible. Yeah, this is uh, called Gokyo. We are on third lake. This is the uh, Gokyo Lake. And we are the elevation of 4,790 meter. And uh, we're going to spend a tonight here. And that is the place where we're staying. And how many lakes are there in this region? Uh, there's uh, five lakes. So this is the third lake. And beyond here, as you can see, that is a six highest mountains where you can see there's a show you, and just on the level there, that is the fifth lake. And uh, and we, the, we, we're spending two nights here, and we're gonna climb that beautiful peak called um, Gokiri to see the whole panoramic view. And this is the most beautiful place. And, and so how high is Gokiri? Gokiri, we'll be, tomorrow we'll be climbing about 5,300 meter. And that is, uh, we're going to walk very early in the morning to catch a beautiful weather. Are we going to make it? No doubt. No excuse. <laughs> it's been it's been a slog getting here. Um, it's just the altitude. It's hard to breathe. It's not physically hard at all. Much harder treks to be had all over the place, but just the breathing. But tomorrow. We're heading up that baby and uh, we're going to get some stunning views of the great mountains around, which I'm really looking forward to. From an altitude point of view, I was feeling fine, but I started to develop kind of basically flu-like symptoms. And I made the real difficult decision of deciding not to climb Gokyo Rai, which was something really on my bucket list, but I just felt that my body needed to rest. And it was that rest decision that I think paid off later in the trip. It was the right thing to do. I wanted to ask Rinzing about the resilience of the Sherpa people, especially the earthquake of 2015, because I knew that the Sherpa people were so reliant on the tourism industries. Well, it was a really disaster, you know, it more affected on the northern part of Nepal. And uh, yes, in Nepal, we had a, a big disaster. Yes, it did affect to us. And uh, well, Kath Kathmandu has been a lot of damage. And uh, they, I mean, we are depend on our tourism. And they, uh, uh, there was, I mean, you know, even the tourists started stopped coming up. So, yes, we... How, how long did it take before the tourism started to, to happen again? It took about a couple of years. And, uh, yes. But <coughs> during that time, I was in Tibet. I was leading uh, the group to the Tibet. Even Tibet was closed uh, due to earthquake. Yeah, it took uh, about a couple of years to recover again. It's still uh, in Kathmandu, it's still doing the reconstruction. I felt that taking a rest day was the right decision. I felt really strong and good, but I was getting a little bit worried about my mate Oli. He was just having problems acclimatizing and breathing, and I was feeling a little bit concerned. Whew. Hard. Beautiful, but hard. And if any of you have been at altitude, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just a lack of oxygen, basically. I mean, we currently stood at the height of the highest mountain in Western Europe, Mont Blanc. Um, and it just makes everything that little bit harder. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be the hardest day of the entire trek along the Chola Pass and uh, probably including some rest breaks will probably be a 10 hour day and um, I think we'll be popping up to about uh, 5,400 meters give or take. Um, in my life I've been a lot higher I've been up to just below 7,000 meters um, but that was with a lot of acclimatization 
And although the acclimatization has been good, it's still hard. And you can probably tell by my voice, it's a little bit, blah, a little bit gruffy. But oh, my God, the scenery, the scenery is absolutely stunning. Just these massive, massive mountains surrounding us. <sighs> Highly recommended if you want to push yourself to the limit, well, not to the limit, but push yourself to a limit, this is a good place to do it. Now on this expedition, we chose to head via the Chola Pass instead of the more directer route to Everest Base Camp. By taking the Chola Pass, the route became a lot more beautiful and scenic and awe-inspiring, but the downside of taking the Chola route is that it's a lot, lot harder. This is the first opportunity we've had to really stop since leaving at about six o'clock this morning. Um, it's just been too cold, too uh, hard going to, to stop and get the cameras out. And uh, the sun has just come out over the valley and everyone is just like, vroom. Uh, plonking down. We've probably been walking for about two hours and we're like iguanas just trying to get some sun, some warmth. Um, but over there in that direction is where we're heading and things always look a lot more foreboding when you look at them. But even so, that doesn't look very friendly. When you're standing at the base of a mountain and you're looking up, you always think, how the hell am I going to get up there? But when you get there, it's actually not that bad. But with the Chola Pass, it was. To be honest, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Not that it was technically difficult or anything like that, but it was at 5,400 meters. And at that altitude, everything is physically demanding. And the Chola Pass was certainly that, extremely physically demanding. Once you've reached the top of the Cholar Pass at 5,400 meters, you have a very dramatic and exciting descent down the Cholar Glacier using crampons. But Rinzing had pointed out that the glacier is in massive decline and they estimate within three years, the Cholar Glacier would have melted. This glacier has been retreating rapidly over the last 10 years or so. And there's lots of little dodgy bits. Wait a second. Okay, I'm through. But wow, what a challenge. What an adventure. And I'm hoping I don't fall over on camera. No, trust your crampons. That's the motto. Ah, oh, anyway. Yeah, so we're at 5,200 meters. As you can probably tell by my breathing. But it's friggin' awesome. Absolutely awesome. What an amazing place. What an amazing place. Oh, there's my friend Ollie. Day. <laughs> what a day it has been. We've got 5,300 meters. Show the pass out. You cannot literally catch your breath. I was five steps and it's still it's just 5,300 meters. You can't get your breath. It's, it's, it's unimaginable. It's profound because mentally you want to move forward and you rest for two seconds, you're like, right, I've got enough energy. And then you take two more steps and you're not going anywhere. So challenging to say the least. <laughs> it's the most challenging thing I've ever done. Definitely one of the most challenging things we've done. Definitely. What an adventure to do for YouTube, eh? Bloody hell. It was definitely, definitely a long day. The Chola Pass was living up to its reputation. Two words, bloody hell. We come over that. Be hard doing it in Scotland. We're doing it at just below, well, doing it at 5,000 meters. 
is another ball game. But what a beautiful, beautiful place. I hope you can hear me okay because my microphone's not working. But that has to be the hardest day I've ever had in the hills. Well, mountains. Yeah, it really was a long day. We're, uh, we're just coming into our accommodation. Whew. Take my, oh, I'm taking it off. I'm gonna throw caution to the sunburn. Oh man. I know I'm doing this voluntarily. And I cannot complain because it's all self-inflicted. And if you are watching this on YouTube, which obviously you are, please give me a subscribe. It's just a click, a little, 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 little click for, I don't know, 10 hours, 11 hours of walking, uh, over 5,500 meters, something like that. Don't quote me on it, please don't. Go, oh, you're a meter out. It was high. I'm tired. And I want to go to bed. I had a little mountain about three hours ago and it has gone to my head. Anyway, that's enough of that. But it's been a fantastic day. Give us a subscribe. And tomorrow will be more adventures somewhere in the Himalayas. I don't know what we're doing tomorrow. And I'll tell you something, it ain't flat. Hang on, there's my mate Ollie Ollie. Hey Ollie Ollie. Not gonna lie. <laughs> hang on, hang on, what was that? Not gonna lie, I'm struggling. It's not gonna lie, it's struggling. Struggling. So I think fatigue and exhaustion is set in. Unfortunately, something that had been plaguing my mind actually happened, and Ollie's health deteriorated due to altitude. And he made the very wise and conscious decision of going back down the mountain. But at the end of the day, he made the very wise decision. My big day had finally come. My ascent to Everest base camp. We're on our way to base camp. I'm guessing this is uh, about 5,100 meters. Uh, our group has found its own pace, so some of the team are really fit and they're jumping on ahead and the rest of us, we're keeping our own pace. And what that does is it allows us to enjoy it because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and if we spend the whole time looking at our feet, catching our breath, what's the point? So. The most important thing when at this altitude is to take your time and enjoy this once in a lifetime opportunity because it is truly, truly amazing. After visiting Everest Base Camp on the north side, I really wanted to visit the south side and now that bucket list had been ticked. I just want to say this whole trip is possible because of this man and the people he works with, the Sherpa people. Yeah. This you. whole man makes it possible and all of the, all of the Sherpa people, which work. Yeah. even if they're not Sherpa, they're Nepali. Nepali. So thank you, I know we're not there yet, yeah. but thank my you. God. <laughs> thank you, Vincent. Thank you, welcome, sir. You have to go to Everest Base Camp and experience it for yourself. It truly is an incredible experience. I can't believe that literally down there is Everest South Face Base Camp. Unbelievable to be here. As we turned the last corner, this amazing, beautiful lake came into shot. It was huge. And we're all like, wow, look at this. And we're taking photos and going, wow, amazing, amazing, amazing. And then Rinzing 
told us a shocking truth, that that lake shouldn't be there, that that lake is the result of global warming, that the glacier had retreated and shrunk. And in fact, that lake was where Everest Base Camp was. This is sinking, I mean, you know, this used to be full of the, uh, the ice. And this is the way they used to set up the camp. But now you can see there's hardly any place where you can you found the lakes there. And since I know it's where that Boulder Rocky is, there we used to play on the ice cave. It's a huge ice cave. But now it's all receding. All receding, melting so fast. So, so, yeah. so, 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 sorry, Rindin, so, so this wasn't here? No, this wasn't here before. This has been, it uh, hasn't been that long since it's been melted all, you know. Uh, how many years? I would say it's uh, within a five, six years. Oh my God. Yeah. It was not that long though. Because we've just come down this slope and gone, oh my God, how beautiful. Yeah, exactly. But you're saying this yeah. wasn't here five years ago? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the, normally where the pista turned. Bloody hell. And that, that where the back, big rock is there, that's where they used to build the helipad is. But there's no any place where you can land on. I, I'm sorry, I find that absolutely shocking. Yeah, that it is. For those that sit there and joke about climate change, yeah, yeah. and to say that a few years ago, this is where you used to make a camp. Absolutely. And now this is now a lake. This is really obsessing. Yeah. Bloody hell. I'm actually almost... I've got glasses on, but I'm actually almost crying. That is profound. That is utterly profound. As I walked the last couple hundred meters into what was the new Everest base camp, what Rinzinger told me about the glacial melt and the loss of the original Everest base camp had shocked me to the core. I'm just walking into Everest base camp. It has been an incredible journey and we're not finished yet. It's a long way back to Kathmandu. And I had this feeling of making a euphoric statement to camera. But what I've just learnt from our amazing Sherpa guide, Rinzing, is that this place has changed so much in the last five years due to global warming that literally behind me in that beautiful lake once was Everest Base Camp. And now we're all celebrating our epic success. And it is a success. But what have we done to our planet to achieve our individual successes? And we are all part of that global problem. This place doesn't know any different but we know the difference. We know what we have done to our planet. This film was supposed to be a euphoric adventure, and it is. And it is to celebrate the lives of the Sherpa people that have given so much to Western climbers. And their blood, sweat and tears is etched on this mountain behind me. But really, as humanity, we need to take a very, very long, long, hard look at ourselves. What happened to me on my 2006 Everest North Face expedition was still very raw in my mind. On that expedition, I'd lost four friends to the mountain. On a personal note, up there on Everest, on Chumalonga, are three friends that I met in 2006. David Sharp, Igor Pushkin, and Thomas Weber. 
and also the memory of a very good friend of mine, Lincoln Hall, who survived one night alone on that mountain and who came down alive and who lived his life to the full only to succumb to cancer. But his spirit, his spirit lives on that mountain. My adventure, which had started in Kathmandu, had been incredible. I had been so looked after by Rinzing and all of the staff working for World Expeditions. My adventure had ticked all of the boxes, but it's left me asking so many questions about our relationship with the natural world and the Buddhist culture that embraces every part of Nepal, perhaps offering an age-old thinking in a modern world, that of balance. Balance between our own collective needs and our need to preserve our very own life support machine. The mother of the world, or in the Sherpa, Shomolunga, the Western name for Mount Everest. <laughs>